Well, I wanna welcome you across all of our locations to Christ Fellowship. So glad you're with us this weekend. You can go ahead and be seated. And a special uh, greeting to our men and women around the world serving in our armed forces. We're so glad that you're tuning in with us online. Um, My name is Ryan, and I have the pleasure of sharing with you from the Word of God this weekend, and I'm excited about what Jesus wants to speak into each and every one of our lives. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever shown up somewhere wearing the wrong thing? Just like moment of honesty, you showed up somewhere and you maybe were dressed too well for the occasion, or you were underdressed for the moment. Like my wife is absolutely obsessed with making sure she's got on the right outfit. Like where are we going? Who's going to be there? What is this again? Like really making sure because she doesn't want to walk into that moment. Um, maybe you have a really bad friend and they told you it was a costume party when it wasn't. You should cut them out of your life in Jesus' name. But We've probably all had a moment where we were wearing the wrong thing. Um, That's happened to me a few times in my life. The the worst time uh, was when I was a sophomore in college. I I was dating Christine, who is now my wife, and she was a student at the University of Florida. And uh, yep, some people will be excited about that. (laughs) And and I wasn't really much of a college football fan at the time. In fact, to this day, my friends still make fun of me because I'm not much of a sports fan. But I was excited because we were going to attend a football game together. She got tickets, and I was going to go with her, drive up to Gainesville, and sit in the student section of the swamp, which I know is a big deal for a football game. So I was up in Gainesville for the weekend and I got dressed for the day and I decided, I can't tell you why, because I've probably not done it before or since, but I wore a purple t-shirt. And so we go to the game and I'm sitting in the student section at the University of Florida in a sea of orange and blue. And from the moments like we walk into the stadium, I am getting death looks from everyone around me. Like if a look could kill, it would have happened in that moment. Everybody, it was like I had a big target on my back. People could throw sodas at me or whatever. And I was like kind of oblivious. Like I'd never been in that setting before. And I'm like, this feels weird. Maybe they just know I'm not a student here or something. And then the moments when the opposing team ran out through the tunnel, it started to make sense because out came the LSU Tigers that day. And if you don't know, if you're not a football fan like me, their colors, purple and yellow. And so all of a sudden, the purple shirt that I had on, it made sense why everyone hated me in that moment. And what it did was it made for an incredibly awkward experience, right? How many of you know when you're wearing the wrong thing makes for an incredibly awkward experience, but when you have the right thing on, it brings freedom. See, in that day, I wasn't able to enjoy the game. I really wasn't able to enjoy the experience because uh, the LSU Tigers won, which made it even worse. (laughs) But I wasn't able to enjoy that experience because I was wearing the wrong thing. Here's my fear. My fear is that far too many Christians wake up and they walk out the door every day wearing the wrong thing. The word that God has spoken over our house this year through Pastors Todd and Julie is the word freedom. We know that's what God wants for each and every one of us. And the reality is we all have to fight for freedom. But my fear is that a lot of us walk out of the door every day wearing the wrong thing. Luckily, we have the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter six, where he outlines for us some things that you and I need to put on. I want you to listen to the word of God very carefully this weekend. Here's what it says. Finally, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul writes this, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after having done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, Paul says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 17. Now the reality is we could spend all night 
talking about various aspects of this passage of scripture and working to understand each piece of God's armor, right? It would take us all day and it would take us all night. We could talk about so many different things, but what I want you to understand is this. You have a better chance in your fight for freedom if you understand a few truths about the armor of God. You and I, in our fight for freedom that we are all facing, we have a better chance in our fight for freedom if we understand these truths about the armor of God. Here's the first truth. The armor of God is suitable for all ages. (laughs) The armor of God is suitable for all ages. Now, I'm just gonna be honest with you for a moment. When I hear the phrase armor of God, my mind goes to some like cheesy kids plastic toys. Like maybe I'm the only one, but when I picture the armor of God, I start to picture kids toys. And like some of you probably even tuned out a little bit when you're like, the armor of God, I've done this. I know about that, right? And that's what I picture in my mind. I picture the kind of thing that you can get on Amazon and order for $29.99, two days shipping, prime, be at your door, little kids' toys. In fact, I did that. This is a picture of our four and a half year old son. Nope, that's not him. This is a picture of our four and a half year old son, Declan, wearing his armor of God that we got on amazon.com. And just because I think it's awesome, this is a picture of our one and a half year old, Kinley, trying to put it on too. But the problem with that is that stuff doesn't fit me. You already saw the picture, but I prove it to you. It doesn't fit me. It doesn't fit. Like I couldn't cram it on. I, the belts, literally, I kind of had to just hang around my waist because it, it wouldn't go all the way around. And I feel like if I'm just honest with you for a moment, that we sometimes think of the armor of God that way, that it's like for kids or it's childish or it doesn't fit, or maybe it's not for you and I. Like it's the kind of thing you learn about in vacation Bible school, or you memorize, or you sing a song about it. But we just, as we get older, some of us naturally, we start to think that it's just for kids. And what if, what if one of the ways the enemy has neutralized this passage of scripture in our lives is by convincing us it's just for kids? What what if one of the ways that the enemy has made our fight for freedom harder is by keeping us away from this passage of scripture because we don't understand it's suitable for all ages. I need it, you need it, my kids do need it, but we need it desperately because we have to make a decision as men and women of faith to put on the armor of God every single day. Why? Here's the second truth, it's essential for survival. We need to understand that the armor of God is suitable for all ages. We can't allow the enemy to convince us that it's just for kids because at the end of the day, the armor of God is essential for survival. The the way Paul talks about it in this passage of scripture, it's quite literally the only way to win. It's the only way to win, to put on the armor of God. Because what he's saying is that you and I struggle not against flesh and blood, not against the physical, but against the spiritual. You and I are under spiritual attack. That's what he wants us to understand. That there is a battle that is going on around us that is more real than the chair that you sit in right now. And we have to prepare ourselves for that battle. In the same way that a soldier suits up physically and marches out to battle protected, you and I every day, we've got to suit up spiritually because this armor of God is essential for survival. He doesn't say, if the powers of darkness come. He doesn't say, if you face the powers of evil. He says, when you do. See, this is a reality for each and every one of us. We face a spiritual battle, and if we're not suited up with what God has given us, then we cannot win. The only way that we can stand firm after the battle is to put on God's armor, meaning that without God's protection over our lives, We cannot stand in the battle that we are sure to face. 
This armor of God, it's not just for kids, it's for each and every one of us. It is essential for our spiritual survival. And it, it might be uncomfortable to like work at these things. It might be uncomfortable to, to think about putting on the armor of God every day, to pray the armor of God over ourselves every day. It might be uncomfortable to think about, man, my salvation needs to affect everything I do. It needs to be a part of every situation. It needs to be a part of the way I think. It might, it might be hard to stand up for truth because of where we work or who we're around. It might be hard to stand for truth. It might be hard to have the gospel of peace ready to be shared and to given, be given to anyone around us. Those things might be, be difficult, right? It might be difficult to get into the word of God every day, but here's what I know. The, the cost of not wearing God's armor is a lot higher it's a lot higher than whatever it costs us to put this on every single day because it is essential for our survival. Here's another truth. The armor of God is almost entirely for defense. Almost. It's almost entirely for defense. See, in this passage of scripture, as we read it, Paul tells us to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But that's the only offensive weapon that you and I are given in all of this protection. So every other element from the helmet to the breastplate to the shield, that's all for protection, right? It's all for defense. But the only offensive weapon that you and I are given is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Here's what that means. There's only one way you can arm yourself for the battle that we are sure to face. It's with this. The word of God is our weapon. The word of God is our weapon. That's why it's so important that you and I know it. It's why it's so important that you and I are constantly consuming the words of God because the word is our weapon. And too many Christians walk out the door every day, march into battle, without their weapon. You can come to church on the weekend and we're so glad that you're here, but that's not your weapon. You can serve in church and we're so thankful for the thousands of dream teamers that do, but that's not your weapon. You can be a prayer warrior and we need them. Intercessors, not the weapon. The only offensive weapon that we are given in God's armor is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I just wonder how many of us walk out the door every day without our weapon. Do you, do you know what the enemy's number one tactic is in our lives? The enemy's number one tactic is we fight for freedom. Do you know what he tries to do over and over and over again? His number one tactic is to get us, you and I, to question the word of God. That, that's his number one tactic. In fact, I would say it this way, it's the oldest trick in the book, literally. Like if you go back all the way to the book of Genesis and you read about when God created everything, right? Think about it for a moment. God speaks everything into existence with his words. He literally breathes stars out, right? And so the world is formed with his words. But there comes a moment where everything changes. God reaches down into what he's created and he forms and fashions mankind. It's the first thing in scripture that God touches. See, the world was formed with his words, but God declared that you were worthy of more than a syllable. He reached down to form and fashion you. And so he creates everything and it's good, right? He steps back and says, it is good. And then, and then he gives it over to mankind. And he gives them these instructions, right? Gives them these instructions, don't eat from this tree. And then what happens? Genesis 3, it's not very long before we mess it up. You know, Satan slithers his ugly little head into this story and he asks one question. These four words change the trajectory of history. You know what he asks? Did God really say? Did God really say? So the oldest trick in the book, Satan's number one tactic in the war against mankind is to get them to question the word of God. Did God really say? And who do he ask it to? Eve. He asks it to Eve. Why? Because in that moment, there's an area of weakness. Listen to me. Here's what happens. She says, yeah, God told us not to eat from that tree. 
or even touch it. So you know what happens in that moment? Eve misquotes God. She gets it wrong. What she does is she adds to what God has said. God gave them one rule. Eve adds to it another. So all of a sudden, things change. It goes from God just trying to protect them from something, and now she thinks that God is trying to limit them in some way. So she misquotes God. He told me not to touch it or eat it. But that's not what God said. And if you go back and you read the narrative, here's what happens. God creates Adam, gives Adam the command, hey, don't eat from that one tree. Everything else, all yours. That one tree, don't eat it. And then he creates Eve. So where's the weakness? Just listen to me. She didn't know the word of God for herself. And my fear is that so many of us, we know the word of God because we're at church, we know the word of God because our parents are Christians or our grandparents are Christians or we know a Christian, but if we don't know the word of God for ourselves, then when Satan slithers his ugly little head into our stories and he asks that question, did God really say, if we don't know the word for ourselves, here's the best answer we can give. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But the word is our weapon. We, we see this so clearly in Matthew chapter four or in Luke chapter four. And maybe you've read this story in scripture before. It's a moment where Jesus is led into the wilderness to be tempted by, by Satan. And so Satan, in that moment, he tries to tempt Jesus to betray who he has been created to be, he tries to tempt him to disobey the word of God. And do you know what he uses to try to get him to do it? What? Scripture. Satan, think about this for a moment. Satan quotes the word of God to the son of God to try to get him to mess up. So let's just think for a moment, if he attacks him in that way, do you know, if you've read this story, the only thing that Jesus is able to use in response or retaliation to the attacks of the enemy, what is it? Scripture. He just quotes scripture back to the enemy. And so here's the question that really messed me up a couple of years ago. Does Satan know the word of God better than I do? Because if so, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. The only reason, I mean, aside from being the son of God, that Jesus was able to stand firm against the attack of the enemy in that moment is because he knew the word of God. More specifically, he knew the heart of God, so he knew what the word actually meant. So you and I have to know the word of God because we too will face that same spiritual battle, that same spiritual temptation. He's going to ask us the same question. Did God really say? And if we have not armed ourselves with the sword of the spirit that is the word of God, then we are defenseless against the attacks of the enemy. I think of the moment in a, in a movie, maybe you've seen a scene like this, where a, a soldier or an officer will sit down with their weapon and they'll have to take it apart and clean it and like put it all back together, assemble it. I've even seen moments in a movie where they would have it all laid out, start a timer, try to do it as fast as they can, assemble it, start, stop the timer, you know, start it, do it all again, work at it over and over and over and over. Why? Because they need to be so intimately acquainted with their weapon that when they march into battle, something goes wrong, something jams up, that they know exactly what to do with it, right? So let me just give you this picture, what if we were so intimately acquainted with the word of God that no matter what happened when we walked out the door, no matter what took place in front of us, we knew exactly where to go and exactly what to say and exactly what to do with it because God has armed us with everything that we need to fight against the powers of evil that we experience every day. See, we need to understand if we want to fight for freedom, We've got to understand that the armor of God is suitable for all ages. It's not just for kids. It's for you and it's for me. We, we need to understand that it's essential for survival. Without God's protection over our lives, we cannot stand in the battle that we are sure to face. We need to understand that it's almost entirely for defense. Don't forget the only weapon that God has given you, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And here's the final truth. The armor of God is actually 
incomplete. The armor of God is actually incomplete. Now, before you send a nasty email to Pastor Todd about me, let me just take a moment and explain what I mean by that. The armor of God is actually incomplete. In this moment, we're given all of these things in scripture, these defensive weapons, we're given one offensive weapon, but there is something we're not given. We're not given a piece of armor for our backs. In in fact, just to show it to you, I I brought another picture of our four and a half year old son, Declan. Suited up, (laughs) strong, ready to go, but yet on his back, completely exposed. And so in this passage of scripture, we're not given anything that covers our backs. Now we're given a lot of other weapons. We're given, for example, the shield of faith. And this looks a lot like the kind of shield Paul was talking about. In fact, he uses a word in scripture that describes a a Roman shield. And it's something like this. It's not a cheesy plastic little kid's toy. It's actually something that was so large that a soldier could get behind it and they would be completely hidden. They would be completely protected. They would almost disappear. And this, they're like as fat as I am. Then you might see a little bit of them. But for the most part, they would completely disappear behind this shield. And so God gives us the shield of faith for protection. But here's the deal. There's nothing to cover our backs. Why is that? Now, some people say it's because as Christian men and women, we're never supposed to retreat. We're never supposed to run away. We're never supposed to turn our backs on a fight. And while that may or may not be true, there are a lot of times in scripture where we are told to run, to flee. I think that perhaps we're not given anything to cover our backs because you're supposed to have mine and I'm supposed to have yours. In fact, the Bible says it this way. It says a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Two can stand back to back and conquer. And so here's the question. Who's got your back? Who's got your back? Because you and I were never meant to fight this battle alone. In fact, if you think about it, these shields, they were never just used in isolation, but Roman soldiers, they would always march out into battle together. Think about legions and all the commanders and all just the the breadth of the army, right? That Paul would have been referring to these, these Roman soldiers, they never marched into battle alone. They always marched out together. And if they ever needed to take ground, what they would do is they would lock their shields together and they would move forward together in strength. These were not just for protection, but this was actually a way that they would advance and take ground because the, the Roman uh, commander, there would be a moment where he would call this out. He would say, testudo. And all of a sudden, they would be able to get into a formation that gave them an incredible opportunity to take ground. This right here is a picture of Christian community, that you and I are not called to put on the armor of God alone, but you and I can fight this battle together. This word testudo, it literally means like tortoise or turtle, which is awesome. But it would provide this protective shell with which the army could move forward. So think about this. It's not just enough that you put on the armor of God. Because if you put it on and I don't, you're still vulnerable. Think about it for just a moment. We, we all have to put on the armor of God together so that we can get in line, we can get in formation, and we together can push back the powers of darkness in Jesus' name. Amen? Come on. We need to work together as Christian men and women to fight the spiritual battle that we are sure to face. Hey, I know these are heavy. Good job, guys. Can you give them a hand for coming out? You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. And so if you're standing alone, you're vulnerable. If you don't have a community of faith, if you don't have people who are going to lock arms with you, lock shields with you, stand with you in this battle, then you are vulnerable. Listen, in your fight for freedom, you need two things. You need the armor of God and you need the people of God. You need the armor of God and you need the people of God. 
It's not just enough to wake up every day and go, okay, Lord, help me to put on the armor. Give me the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. It's not just enough for you to put it on. You also need the people of God who are gonna line up with you, who are gonna take a stand with you, who are going to fight back with you. Don't do it alone. See, for us, it's not just enough that you would come into church every weekend and walk back out because you're still vulnerable. See, what we wanna do is create a place where you can find some men and women of God who are gonna stand next to you in this battle where you could lock your shield of faith with somebody else, where you could discover the family of God, the community of God, because in your fight for freedom, listen to me, this is the word that God has given our house this year through pastors Todd and Julie. It is all about freedom, but in your personal fight for freedom, you need the armor of God, but you also need the people of God. You don't have to leave this weekend without both of those things. Across all of our locations, I would just ask for the next couple of moments that you would close your eyes and bow your heads with me as we pray and respond to the word of God tonight. I've got to believe that there are some people who've walked into one of our locations this weekend and you've not suited up. (laughs) You're not ready for battle. You don't know maybe what that looks like. You don't know maybe how to do it, but we can help you. In this place, this weekend, what we can do is we can pray the armor of God over you. And it will just be a first step to you waking up every day and putting it on yourself. And so if you're a believer in Jesus and you just want somebody to pray the armor of God over you this weekend, that you would be ready to stand firm in the battle that you are sure to face, that you would be equipped in your fight for freedom, just put your hands up in the air so that I can pray for you today. Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now who are saying, we want it all. We want to be protected in the battle that we are sure to face. We want to fight for freedom. And so God, I pray the armor of God over these men and women this weekend. God, I pray that they would have the belt of truth, God, that they would start there. And it seems counterintuitive to put that on first, but God, we know that you are the truth. You are the way, you are the life. And so God, we need you in our lives first and foremost. And if we don't have that, nothing else matters. So God, I pray that they would have the belt of truth, God, that they would have the breastplate of righteousness, that they would have the helmet of salvation, that they would be ready with the gospel of peace, that they would take up the shield of faith and that they would be armed with the sword of spirit, which is your word. Maybe you came in this weekend and you just need to be reminded Armor of God's not for kids. It's time for you to step up and put it on. Maybe you came in this weekend and you just need to be reminded this is essential for your survival. There is no other way to survive unless we put this on. Maybe you came in this weekend and you just need to be reminded that it's time to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You need to know your weapon better than your enemy does. Maybe that's your takeaway this weekend or perhaps you just recognize that It's incomplete, I'm doing my part, but I don't have the right people around me. I'm telling you, you don't have to leave this weekend without coming and having a conversation about what it looks like to get in a group, about what it looks like to find that community, to have the family of God and the people of God. Don't leave without taking that step if that's where you're really at. We also know that across all of our locations, every weekend there are people who come in, maybe you're checking out the whole church thing, but maybe you don't have a relationship with God through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. I just wanna tell you, you don't have to leave here today without that. He is the belt of truth. He is the place where it all starts. The truth is not a thing. The truth is a person. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And you might think that you've wandered into one of our locations this weekend, but you are not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. You are not here by chance. You are here because the spirit of the living God has drawn you to this place because he desperately desires a relationship with you. In fact, he loved you so much that he gave his son Jesus so that you 
could be in relationship with him. Across all of our locations, if you would say, <laughs> I've never began that relationship with God through Jesus, but I want to. I, I want him in my life. I wanna be made new again. I want truth to take over my life. I wanna receive Jesus. If that's you, I just would invite you to put your hand in the air because we wanna pray together this weekend. You're saying, I, I need Jesus. I, I don't have the armor of God over my life. I know I'm up against a struggle. I am not winning. And I wanna tell you that you need a relationship with Jesus because that's where it all starts. If you have your hand up across all of our locations and you're saying, I wanna receive Jesus, my personal savior, we're all gonna pray this prayer together. But if this is your first time, I wanna encourage you just say it a little bit louder than everybody else and make it your prayer. Just say this, just say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I need you. I need you. Come into my life. Come into my life. Make me new again. Make me new again. I give you my sin. I give you my sin. And I receive the eternal life. And I receive the eternal life. That you purchased for me on the cross. That you purchased for me on the cross. And you sealed. And sealed. When you rose again. When you rose again. Three days later. Three days later. As best as I know how. As best as I know how. I will live. I will live. To honor you. To honor you. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Can we make some noise Amen. for all of those people praying that prayer, stepping from death to life, included in the family of God.